Welcome to Real Estate Today. My name is Maria Babicki and I am a licensed area realtor. My co-host and colleague Ed Cox is unable to be in the studio today for filming, but he will be here next time. Today our topic is septic systems. Jason Lachance of Small Town Septic is here to tell us everything we need to know about septic systems. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you, Maria. Um, why don't we begin by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to the business? Well, my name is Jason Lachance. I'm from Granby, Connecticut. Um, I started my first excavation company in 2003, um, and we did general excavation, general site work for several years. Um, amongst the tanking of the real estate market, kind of put a shortfall to our business. So we looked to, we were already licensed in the trade of installing septic systems. So we looked towards more of the service end of that in 2008. So me and my wife decided to start Small Town Septic. And uh, we've had amazing success with that, where we've really been able to grow it into something that is really our whole focus pattern. So we don't really do anything else than septic work these days. It's been very good. Very okay, good. that's great. Can you tell us a little bit about how septic systems work? Because a lot of us don't understand it. <laughs> I can understand that. It's a, it's a lot of stuff that's located under the ground that you don't see. And if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. Mm -hmm. So the way it works is in a typical home, and each house can have some variation to this, but your typical home will have your house in a four inch main discharge line. And that line is feeding a septic tank. Now we're bringing your material from your home to your septic tank at, there at a great rate of speed, meaning that the pipe is pitched down very heavily. The reason we're doing that is a lot of times you have a solid component coming with this material or this liquid affluent traveling and we wanna make sure it gets from your house into your septic tank itself. Once it enters the tank, we wanna stall the flow. So we use what is called an inlet baffle. And that can take different styles of inlet baffles, but the most similar ones are either a split wall baffle or a T-drop baffle. And that is merely taking the water and pushing it straight down. So you have this water, this affluent coming from your home, discharged into this tank, and it's coming down the pipe. It hits this wall and it pushes it straight down. Now the bottom of a typical septic tank will be completely flat. So we've essentially stalled the flow that molecule has fallen in and it is not moving anymore. We would like each molecule to spend roughly about 48 hours inside this tank for treatment. Now depending on the age of your system and the style of the one that you have installed, you could have different styles of septic tanks. Newer stuff would be two compartment, older tanks would just be one large single compartment. You're always going to have an outlet baffle on your outlet side of your septic tank. That is doing a couple things, but mostly it is keeping your light floatable solid inside the tank and not letting it exit to your leaching system. So if you can picture this water molecule is now stalled out. As you push more material into the tank, you're pushing this molecule across it. We would like and hope in that 48 hour time period that that light solid material would separate and float to the top. The heavy solid would then drop to the bottom and then your liquid would pass on through to your leaching system for soil treatment. Once your liquid passes on through, depending on the style of leaching system that you have, you're going to screen that dirty water using your soil. So that is going to screen out any bad bacteria, pathogens, any negative pretty much things that are t attached to that molecule, and then let the water travel back in in a clean version into a natural water course where it can be recycled back up into the rain, into a river, into our drinking resources, things of that nature. But the water is essentially clean. Now how far is a septic system required to be from the well? Proper separation distance is 75 feet to be maintained from all wells. Mm -hmm. That includes your own and all neighboring properties. Um, in some cases, you do not have the space on your particular property to maintain that separation distance. In those cases, we will issue what's called state variances. So the health code reads one way and what we can accomplish is in another way. We will give you a variance to the health code, meaning it could not be reached no matter what we did with the septic system. If you have a state variance, it is considered to be an approved practice of installation. So it's just a, a certain step, but maintaining 75 feet of separation is state health code guidelines. Now, 
should that rise a lot of concern if your, your septic system is not 75 feet away from your well? Not necessarily. If you can picture water does not move horizontally through the earth, it moves up and down. So it's always a weight of up and down. To get across contamination between your septic system and your actual drinking water source or well, you would have to be tapping off the same sources. So your water molecule, your liquid affluent from your septic system would have to hit some kind of bedrock or something like that that was not letting that water material get screened through any kind of organics or any kind of soot. And then it's running down into your well itself. And then you could have a contamination of water. But that is a very, very rare thing. All a right. very rare thing. Now, if you want to find out about your septic system or someone else's, exactly where do you go? Well, it depends on the area that you're in. But considering we're in Simsbury, this is Farmington Valley Health District. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have a wonderful website that is super easy to use. It's fvhd.org. And there is a document search page there. So if you type in the name of your road, and then you'll click on, and you'll get all the addresses that they have a file for on that property. If you do not see your address listed there, that is not uncommon. The health department was instituted in 1978. They did a major records transfer from all the local town health departments to the Farmington Valley. Some of those records did not pass through as well as they had liked, and sometimes you do not have a file that travels with the property. If you have a newer home, you are guaranteed to have a large documentation trail that travels with it. Or if you've had any major repairs made to your septic system, if you've had a tank installed, if you've had a new leach field installed, if you've had a full repair done to your septic, within the last 30 years, you will have a large amount of documentation that travels with that. Okay, so if you're considering purchasing a home where nothing's really been done since before this was instituted, how do you go with, what do you do in that case? Well, you would have to, you know, if there's no documentation, you're going to have to hire an inspection company like us, or there's several other good ones in the area mm -hmm. that would in turn locate and possibly map out for you what you exactly have. Um, obviously, it's good to know where your septic is for multiple reasons. If you are purchasing a home and you might possibly want to install a swimming pool shortly after you buy the house. You want to know that where I was planning on putting my swimming pool is not on top of my septic system for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted an in-ground swimming pool, you have to maintain 25 feet of separation from that pool and your septic system in completion. That means that your septic tank and also your leaching system. So sometimes that is something that is difficult to accomplish, especially in the best place possibly suited to put the swimming pool in your backyard. Um, so those are things to take into consideration because if you're planning on buying a house and then putting a pool in right away, you might have to move the septic system, which would carry its own expense with that. And you want to make sure that you're pre-planning for all your liabilities. Um, beyond that, it, if you really wanted to locate everything, you can map everything out in a whole sequence using a certain amount of scopes and location equipment. I wouldn't necessarily say that that's necessary for too many people. Um, just having a general idea is going to be good enough. Okay. Let's talk about regular maintenance and why it's necessary and how often you do it. Well, regular maintenance is going to be based off of your usage stream. So obviously this is based off a of discharge load. So each family is different. We all use different cleaning materials. We all wash our clothes in a different way. We all take different lengths and longevity of showers. And we all use different soaps and, and so on and so forth. And there's multiple different ranges of amounts of people living in, in a house. Now, your safe rule of thumb for a family of four, basically, a typical family would be two to five years would be your cleaning strain. So you'd be somewhere in that range. Now to back that up a little bit on why we need to actually clean our septic tanks is we're mostly trying to remove the solid content out of a septic system when we clean the tank. The reason being that we want to remove the solid content is we want to keep the best oxygen source inside the tank itself. Oxygen plays such a key role in a septic system that most people don't know. So as that material is separating from that water molecule, it's also accumulating. 
Now we do have some decomposition or decomposing rates for that material itself, but on a typical septic system it will accumulate faster than it can decompose. So you're going to get a whole layer, a scum layer and a sludge layer and a liquid layer. So if you were looking at a cross section of a septic tank, you would be looking at your scum layer on the top, which would be your light floatable solid, made up mostly of toilet paper and things of that nature. Then you would have your liquid layer that lies in the middle, which is all the water affluent that has released most of its you know, uh, solid material. And then your sludge layer, which is your heavy biosolid, typical you know, um, human waste and things of that nature. Now, the light floatable solid is accumulated in this actual section of the septic tank where we're trying to develop the most oxygen. So you, on the top of your water is where most of your air is going to be. As you add a light floatable solid to that, you're pushing the air out and lessening that space. But on top of that, you're also capping off the liquid. Mm -hmm. So now the liquid has lost its oxygen source. The reason that we want to keep the most oxygen inside that water is to keep the best aerobic base to it. So you have two major types of bacteria inside a septic system. You have aerobic, which is surviving with oxygen, and you have anaerobic, which is without. Now, as you screen an anaerobic base through an organic material, you're going to leave a waste product behind that. So if you can get down to your leach field and look at a cross-section of that and see the interface in between the field and the organics, which is the soil, as that anaerobic base is pushed through there, it's leaving a waste product behind it. Now, this is not something that we would see with our own eyes. These are microorganisms. But over a period of time, somewhere between 30 and 60 years, this will build up and form what we call as biomat formation. Now, biomat formation will eventually encapsulate the leaching system itself. It will not let the water exit as fast as we discharge it there. And that's when we start to run into a failure rate. Now, the only way to really counteract that is by using aerobic base or something with oxygen. So, if you're screening an aerobic base through that same organics, you are not leaving that waste product behind it. So the more aerobic base to that affluent exiting our tank that we can maintain, the longer the leaching system will last in a hole. I always use the, it's like changing the oil on your car. If you don't change the oil on your car, you're not going to have an instantaneous negative reaction. Your car might, the get 100,000 miles out of the motor. But if you change the oil every 3,000 miles, you're likely to get 300,000 miles out of the motor. It's kind of the same concept with a septic system. You hear your neighbors say, I've never had my tank pumped in 20 years. Well, typically 20 to 25 years from the start of the septic, if you never have it cleaned, you'll be putting a new septic system in. Where if you maintained it and cleaned it every two to five years, typically you'll see somewhere between 50 and 60 years worth of effective use out of it. Well, it so seems like a small cost for it the is. benefit. It's definitely a lot smaller cost to just maintain it and clean it and take good care of it. And on top of that, that's protecting our natural water sources, which is really what a septic system is all about. Mm -hmm. If you look in third world countries where they show the sewage is just direct discharge, even Rio, where the Olympics is right now, they're showing video of direct discharge sewage just into their water courses. Well, that's a direct contaminant. And we're lucky to live in a place where that doesn't happen. And we have, you know, different institutions that mandate that we treat our sewage in certain ways. And that keeps a healthy environment for us all. Okay. Um, why are uh, uh, baby wipes and such items uh, a problem? Well, if you can picture, so, I mean, a lot of people will talk about their toilet paper and, and stuff like that. And baby wipes, again, are a, a very big nuisance for me as a septic guy. Um, they're not uh, what we like to see in a septic system, but if you choose and have to use them, you are welcome to. And if you have to put them down your toilet, you can do that you will just clean your tank a lot more often. Mm -hmm. um, you'll back it all the way down to months instead of years. Um, the reason being is a baby wipe is like putting a towel down into your septic system. 
if we're trying to eliminate that light floatable solid and you put a bunch of towels down there, obviously that is not going to play into your hand. No, that doesn't um, sound like a good idea. <laughs> so it, they accumulate rather quickly and they do not decompose at all. Mm -hmm. Even if on the label they do say septic safe, we have found that we're just not seeing a decomposition rate that we find suitable with those. Okay. So it's like putting a bunch of rags inside your septic system. You can get solid transfer above your baffles with them because they accumulate so quickly and they also cap off the oxygen source rather quickly inside the tank. So if you do choose to use those things and then you do choose to throw them down your toilet, you should choose to clean your septic tank every three to six months possibly, mm -hmm. um, which is an expensive undertaking. I do not recommend that you do that. If you do choose to use those products, which they're fine to use, just throw them in the garbage. And that's a nice way to get rid of them without having any extra incurred costs. Okay. Um, how about basic uh, uh, maintenance as far as what you, the safety, like putting grease down your garbage disposal, how the garbage disposal ties into this whole thing. So a garbage disposal is, is a nice thing to have. I have one at my own house and I have a septic system. Um, we can, grease is a totally different thing. So grease, no matter if you had sewer, septic, any kind of disbursement of waste at all, grease is going to be very tough. If you can envision grease is something that is a liquid when you're pouring it down somewhere until it gets cold. Mm -hmm. Well, typically inside a pipe, you're going to have cold water. So it's going to come in contact with that. It's going to solidify and then it's going to get hard. At the same token, it's very sticky. So it's going to stick to your piping. It's going to stick to your everything and it's going to cause you clogs and it can transfer out into your leaching system because it does transfer as a liquid. So a lot of times it will not release off the water molecules and then it will cause you an issue in your leach field. Um, grease is just a no, all the way around. Um, I would suggest not to use grease down your drain in any scenario. Um, beyond the grease, a garbage disposal is something that is nice to have. Um, when you're using it, I see the TV commercials where they say put all your food waste and save yourself from any trouble with animals in your garbage can um, down your, your garbage disposal. I would not suggest to do that with a septic system. Um, on multiple levels, you're causing issues. For the first, you, you're putting an undecomposed matter inside a septic tank. Now, an undecomposed matter is something the biology in the tank is going to focus on, and it's going to kind of pull itself away from the things that we want it to focus on down there. So you're going to change that dynamic slightly. Um, again, typical vegetable waste or, or things of that nature is going to be a floatable solid, so that will instantly float to the top. Um, again, we're concerned with uh, solid transfer out into the fields, possible jumping over baffles and things of that nature, but mostly it's going to cap off that oxygen source again inside the tank at a quicker version. Now, if you choose to throw every bit of your food waste down your tank, we would hope that you would clean your septic tank a little more often. Um, not as often as if you were doing the baby wipes, but maybe you would be back down to like a year or something like that. Um, more what we would rather see you do is scrape the waste into the garbage and the little bit that would get caught in the drain that becomes a nuisance, that is fine to travel down through the garbage disposal. That's how we use the one at our house. Okay. What about driving over the leach fields? If you So driving over, this would be another reason why you would want the location of your septics if you were buying a new house. Say you're moving in and you want to move all your stuff in, obviously you're probably going to have a large truck or something and you might find yourself where you might want to drive over a different part of your yard than you typically would. Um, the component tree of a septic system or the leach field itself, it depends on what style leach field you have. Um, they make several different products to create a leach field and some of them are made out of plastic and some of them are made out of concrete, some are just piping. There's a lot of different things and some of them are, are fairly fragile, you know, for, for dense load pressure. Um, so my best advice in that scenario is just not to do it. If you truly could not find a way around it, I would definitely do my due diligence and find out what type of leach field I had, call your service provider and ask them if it would be safe to drive what style vehicle and how much weight possibly would be in it. 
um, that would give you the best probably results at the end. At least you would have some knowledge going going forth. Is this true that some people have leach fields running under their driveway? It is very true. I just installed a new leach field at my own house this past winter and we put it underneath my driveway. Um, if you're going to do that, you're going to have an H20 load system, it's called. So it's specifically designed to be driven on by all vehicles. Um, so we wouldn't have an issue of a low density problem. Um, they're typically going to be made out of concrete, they're concrete structures, um, and they're going to actually be double the thickness of a standard capacity system. So the concrete will be double the amount. It is not something that would typically be put in unless it was going to be put in in a driveway. Purely off the fact that it's really not cost effective while you're installing it because there's so much more product involved in it. Okay. All right. And as far as um, the number of bedrooms in relation to the septic tank size, say you have a four bedroom house and you've decided to put on an addition with a fifth bedroom, but you've, your septic system was created in mind for the four bedroom. How does that pan out? So a lot of people give us this call. This is a pretty common thing that we get all the time where people are purchasing a new house and they have uh, the thought that we're going to buy this house and upgrade it mm -hmm. and we want to put a, a fifth bedroom or a sixth bedroom or a third bedroom onto a two bedroom, whatever it may mm -hmm. be. Now, the beauty with the health code, the way it reads, is that we do not need to update the systems. You're already incurring a cost of putting on a, a addition or, or whatever you may be doing to the home. So they do not make you incur a cost that you have to update the system at that point. What they will do is when that septic system comes to failure, so when, when its time does come due, you will have to bring that up to a code compliant repair at that point. So whatever the structure is that's standing there at the time the system does fail, you will be required to meet the health code for that structure. So if you had a three bedroom septic system and you added two bedrooms to the house and then you had a five bedroom home and the system fails, you'll be required to install a five bedroom code compliant septic system at that point. Um, the difference is, you know, these septics are oversized inheritively. It's state health code. You know, this is a state agency, so everything is, is somewhat oversized. Um, we're giving to each bedroom, we're figuring for two people for each bedroom, which obviously is not the standard. Most people have one person in most bedrooms and then maybe two in one of them. So we give two people to each bedroom and 75 gallons to each person each day which is inheritably a decent amount of, of, of water for a person to use. Um, so I think that if you chose to add a, a bedroom to your home, you, you probably would be just fine going forward. You just need to know that if it does fail, that you would have to bring it up to health code standards at that point. Okay. Now, um, a question is, what about um, if you have access to the sewer from the house you you purchased. Mm -hmm. What What is your responsibility <coughs> to tie into the public sewer? So you don't have any responsibility to tie into the public sewer. Um, in different towns, like in Simsbury, it is a requirement if the sewer is stretched out in front of your home, if you have the main in front and they do have egress into the main for you, meaning they have a lateral attached to your property, that you will no longer be able to obtain permetry to repair your septic system. Mm -hmm. So at that point you would be mandated to, if you had an actual problem with your septic, you would have to tie into the sewer. So they don't make you do it when they bring it across or in front of your property. So you aren't forced to do it at that point. It's just in different locations, it's different. It doesn't work that way in every town. Some towns do not have any say in it and you still can fix your septic with sewer running in front of you. Um, typically, the the big cost with sewer is getting the main in front of your house. There's going to be an assessment fee. So if that assessment fee is going to be paid whether you tie into it or not, so typically most people would feel that that would be a value to tie into the sewer at, if it went in front of their house and the assessment had already been paid. It would be less expensive than, than fixing a septic system. Okay. Now we're winding down our show, but you just said something interesting. Um, how a lot of people think that a septic is a turnoff in terms of cost, 
but we've discussed that before the show, and you had some thoughts about that, sewer versus septic. Well, sewer versus septic, so to use a sewer, you're going to have some kind of fee for using a sewer every year. So I don't, I don't have sewer. I never have had it, but I know there's a fee that travels with it. There's mm-hmm. several people that work at the sewer department that, that re- you know, require a paycheck to be there, so somebody has to pay for that. Um, septic systems are essentially free to use. There's no fee tied to them. Um, proper maintenance is really the only cost. So if we took that sewer assessment fee and we started you out with a brand new septic system and your neighbor started out with sewer, brand new, brand new. We went through the course of an entire lifespan of a septic system, which we're saying on average is somewhere between 30 and 60 years. So say you made it 50 years with your septic system. Well, if you save dollar for dollar that fee of using the sewer every single year for those 50 years, you would be able to pay for your cleanings and pay to restore your septic or replace the septic when that time came due. And you would still have money left over at that time. So in those figurative amounts, the septic system would be less, less money in a hole. Now what happens is most people purchasing homes are purchasing a home with a dated septic system or an older septic system. In a lot of places nowadays, real estate seems like we have a lot of septics from the 70s and early 80s, late 60s, things of those natures. If you have a septic system and you purchase it at a later date, so say it's a more dated system, um, you probably, those figures would not play out to be the same for you, obviously. Um, It would only work if you started new to new. Um, But it's still a great way to treat sewage affluent. Um, If you look through the studies, treating sewage affluent with your soil is going to hands down get it to be the cleanest it can be. Um, So far cleaner than we could do in a treatment plant style setting. So it's a really, really good thing for the environment. Um, And on top of that, it's really kind of maintenance free for the homeowner themselves. They can call a service provider um, and we'll come out and we, we even dig the holes up for you. So you really don't have any involvement in it. And we clean your septic tank out every two to five years. And that's really all you have to worry about it. Um, it it's, it's a nice, nice solution to a problem. Okay. We have less than a minute left. But a question for you is, um, what are the main points you would stress to our viewers about Main points that I would stress is, is what we're discharging down the drain mm-hmm. to keep an eye on that. So no, no baby wipes, feminine products, and use your gar- garbage disposal more lightly. If you choose to use it heavily or more heavy or use any of those products down the drain, then, then try to service your septic system more often to, to save yourself some money in the long run. Um, do not be scared of septics. Do not be scared of homes with septics, especially in our area. This is going to be something that is not going to go away. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of beautiful homes that have septic systems that are not anything to be scared of. Um, do do your due diligence if you're. This is your first time with a septic. Do a little little research on Google and and understand what you have. Um, knowledge is wealth with these things, and this isn't something that you typically would just learn in school. So understanding what you have is, is really a, a big benefit. Okay. I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and you do a great job. And, you know, we've used your services, and we're very happy with you. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. And uh, to the viewers, we want to say thank you for watching our show, as always. Ed will be back next uh, time, and um, we appreciate you tuning in. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.